Hi, welcome back. This is Chef Paul coming to you from the Advanced Technology Center here at Gulf Coast State College. And we're on our journey of wine. And I'd like to start you where I start all of my students. Part of understanding and appreciating wine is developing a brand new vocabulary. How do you know how to explain or express something if you don't have the words to describe it? So typically in my classes, I'll hand each student something like a strawberry and I will have all the class look at the strawberry and I'll say, what color is this? And invariably somebody says, red. And I say, no, look at it again. And then they say, oh, red, white, green, brown, lots of other colors. And then I say, well, smell the strawberry. What does it smell like? And invariably somebody will say, well, chef, it smells like a strawberry. I'm like, well, what does a strawberry smell like? Does it smell sweet? Think of some words. Sweet, grassy, herbaceous, earthy. And then I say, okay, now take a bite of the strawberry and taste it. What does it taste like? By now they're catching on to me. Even though somebody will always say it tastes like a strawberry, I'll say, now start to describe it. By this time, they're starting to get a little bit smarter about it. And I'm at the board writing down the words that they say. Someone will say, watery, great descriptive word. Someone will say, acidic, sweet, of course. Somebody might say, it's bland, or that it's not sweet, or that it's bitter. There are all different kinds of words that we use to describe all the flavors that we encounter on a daily basis. But how can you really learn to appreciate wine if you don't have the vocabulary to describe what the wine is? All of my students start with the same, typically the same bottle of wine. Usually I start them with a West Coast Riesling, something like this Chateau Saint-Michel from the Columbia Valley. Now, the reason I pick a Riesling is because it is a pretty typical grape. I pretty much know what it's going to give you. Like a one-trick pony, it's going to smell a certain way, it's going to taste a certain way. Not all Rieslings are sweet. Not all Rieslings are dry. They don't all taste the same, but we can pick a basic varietal like this grape, Riesling. And by the way, that word varietal is talking about the grape. When we look at this and it says Riesling, that's the actual grape that is being pressed into this wine. Now, here in the United States, there are laws regarding if we put Riesling on the label, that it's got to be 75% Riesling in the bottle at a minimum. There were times that it was only 51%, and different countries have different laws when it comes to labeling. But here in the United States, you're going to see typically a name, the grape, where it's from, a vintage, and vintage just refers to the year that it was produced. And this one says 100% um, vinifera, which is talking about the rootstock. The other piece of information that's required on a label is alcohol content and any, if any, sulfites are added to the wine. You'll find all this information on every bottle that's produced here in the United States for sale commercially, okay? When we get into labels from other countries, we're going to talk about those labels, and I'm going to help you become maybe not a wine expert, but a little bit more informed. It's going to help you be able to pick out some wines. So again, this is where I typically start people, with a West Coast Riesling. I want them to experience this because a lot of my students say they don't like wine. And maybe their experience with wine, or their first experience with wine, wasn't that great. If I poured every brand new student a glass of room temperature Cabernet, they would all hate wine forever. So instead, I start them out with what I would call a more pedestrian, an approachable wine like this Riesling, because I know that it is a very drinkable wine, okay? Not a lot of layers to it, but it still is something nice very inexpensive, under $10 a bottle, but still it's not quite some of the uh, jug wine that you might find at the grocery store. 
So how do we go about opening? First, I want to talk to you about choosing a bottle. There are a couple things that you want to be careful of. Not as much with wines that are produced in the United States, but with wines that are coming from overseas, there are a few things to look for. Typically, wine is transported in giant container, um, cargo containers. And if it gets too warm, there's something called getting cooked, okay? That's one of the few things that we've got to be careful of. So when we're in the grocery store picking out a bottle of wine, how do we choose it? And how do we know that it's good? There's really no way to know if it's good or not, but if you're picking out a wine that's not produced here in the United States, something that's had to travel to get here, there are some warning signs that I'd like to talk to you about. Wine that spends too long at too high of a temperature will get what's called cooked. And there are a couple of signs that are telltale signs of a cooked bottle of wine. First off, if the foil isn't loose, that's a good sign. Second off, if you see tears of stains running down the outside of the bottle and the foil is stuck, that's a great sign to tell you that the wine has gotten overheated. And when it gets overheated, it expands and pushes some of that up through the um, cork. Third thing is when you rub your hand over top of the bottle, the cork should be even or depressed lower than the edge of the bottle. If the cork is raised at all, Put that bottle back, get a different one. If the cork is raised, that tells you that something in, has caused the pressure inside this bottle to increase. Well, there's really only one thing, and that's heat. Heat causes gases to expand. If the wine got hot, it would have expanded, and the cork would have gotten pushed up. There's no CO2 in here, it's just air. So the cork would have gotten pushed up. Put that bottle back and grab another one. So. How do we open wine? Well, we're gonna, I typically, even though my wine waiter's friend has a knife on, I like to just pull the foil right off. And it's called a capsule or a foil. And they're just heat shrunk onto the outside of the bottle. And I pull it off. And now you can see that the cork is nice and level with the top of the bottle. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open my wine key up open up the corkscrew part and if you notice I'm gonna lay my corkscrew down and put that screw right in the middle and I'm gonna start to spin it in okay when my students are opening wine for a guest they're typically going to be doing this by hand with what we call a serviette which is just a small napkin and I don't want that label to spin I want the guest to see the label the whole time now a couple things I want you to remember you don't have to screw that corkscrew all the way in. As a matter of fact, I really don't want to see it come through the bottom of the cork, okay? Because that will actually cause debris to go into the wine. If I leave two good turns left, that's fine. Now, with this style, I'm going to close it. And if you notice, there's two hinges here. I'm going to push this in and then lift up. And it only lifts up that far. That's not fully open. So now I bring that hinge up again and lift it straight up. Now, wine should be open with a whimper or a sigh, not a pop. Just that gently. Now, we'll unscrew the cork. You can present it to the guest. Um, it's not done as much. Some places will higher in places where you're um, serving much more expensive wine. The cork will tell you a story. Sometimes you'll see crystals on the bottom of a, um, bottom of a cork or if the cork has gotten um, damaged in any way. So we'll set that down and now let's pour a glass of wine. Classically, when my students are serving to a guest, they're gonna pour whoever ordered the wine a taste, a small taste. Uh, wine bottles are um, typically you're going to find something a small divot in the bottom of the wine bottle it's called a punt and uh, it's part of the shape of the glass but you can also use it to hold the glass the bottle and pour like that when we're pouring wine again for our my students I don't like them to um, move it so that the label is not visible to the guest and also you want to be careful don't let the rim touch the glass. I've seen them shatter at times and it makes noise. And all we're gonna do 
is typically will pour a little taste for the guests. And you saw that little twist at the end. That helps to stop the wine from flowing. Now the guest is going to take a look. They might swirl the glass like this. What we're doing is we're trying to open up the wine. I can already smell this. To me, this Columbia Valley Riesling smells like Granny Smith apples. It is just really hits me in the face with it. And we're going to take it and give it a little sniff and then a taste. If the guest likes it, then we'll pour the rest of the glass. And typically, I don't, I'm not gentle when I'm pouring wine. I want to splash it in. I want to splash it in because that's oxygenating, opening up that wine and giving us those aromas. So what do we do from here? We're going to look at it first. It's got a pretty pale golden color. We might say straw. Usually I'll have the students with a white piece of paper. They'll hold the glass down over the paper and they'll look at the wine through the glass onto the white. And it's going to do a few things. It's going to project a color right down onto our glass, onto our white, but you're also going to be able to see in the disc, you're going to see if there's a watery edge to the wine. You're going to notice clarity. You're going to see real color. All these things are going to be very visible when you're looking at the wine. So remember, we eat with our eyes first. We're also going to drink with our eyes first too. So we've looked at the color. There may be some debris in the wine. Invariably, as wine ages, we get things, they're called lees, L-E-E-S, that fall out of the wine. They're going to get into the wine. Don't worry about it. It's not going to hurt you. And when we get into decanting later on in this series, I'll show you a way that you're going to be able to keep those out of your wine. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to swirl it. Not being gentle. And I'm going to look at it, and I'm going to look at the legs or tears. Um, they're evidence of glycerin content, alcohol. People will say it will give you a, an idea of mouthfeel. Um, for me, it's just one more way to open up the wine a little bit more. Okay, now we're ready for our first sniff. See, swirl, sniff. Okay, that's the third thing. And I close my eyes and put my nose in it. And I get that first smell. Your olfactory sense is the strongest sense tied to memory. So if you have this log book of memories of smells in, in your head, this is really going to be strong. And for me, it smells like apples. And you're saying, well, wait a second, chef. It's grape juice. I know, it's grape juice. But it smells like green apples. It's really, really powerful. I'm going to smell it again a second time. As this wine is sitting, it's opening up. And other smells are coming through now. I'm losing a little bit of the apple smell. I'm getting some acidity in there, some, maybe some smell of earth. And the French have a word for that. The French word is terroir, T-E-R-R-I-O-R. -R -R. And it means everything to wine because the ground gives you all these flavors and senses. You might smell, it may smell vegetal. It may smell chemical, okay, or it may smell a myriad of things from vine fruit to tree fruit to um, different kinds of, of tropical fruits, really almost anything you can imagine, all the way to gravel, earth, to wet dog, okay. All these smells, all these words describe the smells you're getting. This one pretty much isn't giving you a lot of other notes. I'm getting a little bit of stone fruit, like white peaches also, which is a pretty um, telltale sign of this, of this um, Riesling. So, we've done three. See, swirl, smell, and now it's time to sip. When we sip the wine, we want to take a small mouthful, pull some air into it, and let it really wash over our whole mouth to get the whole feel of it. And this way we can actually start to describe the taste. And the taste should back up what you just smelled. If you smelled green apples and white peaches, 
then it shouldn't smell, then it shouldn't taste like, I don't know, lychee fruit or gravel. Those smells should back up. And chew on it a little bit. Let it wash all over your mouth. You're gonna get sweet first, right on the tip of your tongue, and then it'll wash back. For this one, I'm really getting flavor back on the back sides of my, back sides of my mouth, into the very top of my throat, and it stops about here. Nothing else. I, I just get a little bit of an alcohol to there. Part of that is because we've gotta be concerned with serving at the right temperature. But it pretty much backs up taste of that peaches taste and the apples. This wine, a great wine to serve for the first time to people who maybe haven't tried wine or haven't experienced wine. And it's something that'll get you started. Now, we've got an issue. We've got this bottle here and I'm at work so I really can't be drinking this whole bottle today. So what am I gonna do? Well, I'm gonna preserve this. Now, I can preserve this in a refrigerator for a period of time, realizing though is that as soon as I've opened it, I've got a limited amount of time refrigerated, maybe a week to be able to finish consuming it, okay? So I use this neat little gadget, they're very inexpensive. We could simply put the cork back in it and put it in the fridge if we're gonna drink it in the next day or so. No problem whatsoever. But if you really wanna try your best, we can put this in and then we're gonna set this on top And what I'm doing is I'm vacuuming out the air. And now my wine doesn't have any air. You might even see some bubbles starting to come up that are being released from inside the wine. Now, no air. If we've got no air, we can't oxidize. And that wine's gonna stay good for at least a week, maybe two. As long as we do this every time we open it up. So I hope this was a good introduction for you into the world of wine tasting and maybe get you to go out and buy a bottle of white wine just to try it. We're gonna progress through the wines from whites, from something very easy and approachable like a Riesling, up into the, maybe the Pinot Grigios and the Sauvignon Blancs, all the way to a, a big California Chardonnay. And then we'll get into red wines from the easy drinking red wines like the Pinot Noirs and um, Grenaches, all the way up to finally Cabernets and the Bordeaux blends, what we call the Meritage. So I hope you're looking forward to this journey. I am, and I'll see you next time.